big data monitoring. I'm going to turn it over to Young, who is going to go through a little bit of a monologue on big data monitoring. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Brock. Okay, so my name is Young Pak. I am the uh, director of the Performance Lab here at Aerospike. So it's my job to make sure that everything uh, works and works quickly. Uh, so I do a lot of testing. And uh, in terms of the reasons why we're here, I uh, just want to go through a really quick presentation because I think most of you are already familiar with this. Just want to make sure. Uh, there are different areas of big data today. There's, of course, collecting data. You got to make sure that you have all of the data. And there's increasing amounts of this not just logs, they might come from tweets, they might come from all over the place. You also need to analyze it in different ways. Uh, you, and of course, big data is usually synonymous with Hadoop, but you might also be using other uh, technologies. And then finally, there is what I refer to as operationalizing. And that means you want to take the analysis and actually do something with it in, in some way, shape or form. <clears throat> So when we think about actually collecting the data, we've got uh, web, we've got mobile, we've got uh, Internet of Things. All of these are definitely possible. The analysis uh, can be done by a variety of different products. But uh, again, Hadoop is a big one. Uh, the th members of our panel here today are from Pepper Data, AltaScale, and Data Torrent. And we're going to explore how they've gone ahead and handled their big data environments. Uh, a lot of people have asked us this in the past. Why does Aerospike care about big data? Uh, and we actually feel that we are a part of big data because when it comes time to doing the analysis, you might need to do something with it, meaning you want to make it operational, you want low latency to that database, uh, and that's, that's where Aerospike comes in. Uh, you, of course, also have reporting, or you might want to put that data into a SQL database as well. So when it comes to Hadoop, there are some big pluses and minuses to this, and I, I just want to set up the panel uh, with these sorts of considerations. Uh, first of all, one of the big pluses of Hadoop is that you can distribute the analysis to a lot of servers. And it's no longer just going to be a handful. You're talking dozens, hundreds. I've seen thousands of servers uh, all operating on, on Hadoop. Uh, it's replicated for failover. And the, uh, the thing is that uh, this is going to replace systems where you might have had a large monolithic system before and allows you to be much more scalable and flexible. The minuses of this are it's a lot of servers. Um, so again, ten, hundreds, thousands of servers, these are things that are a little bit difficult to manage and you need to understand exactly what you're looking for with these things. Uh, and in many cases, these systems are no longer uh, homogeneous. You're not talking about the exact same kind of node. You're talking about maybe different kinds. Uh, you can't buy the exact same servers all the time. You don't want to. You need to be able to evolve and, and use faster servers. So you're going to have a real heterogeneous environment and making the most of that is going to be challenging. Uh, in addition to that, as uh, I, th I think as we all know, once you have a system live and it's actually useful, more and more people will begin to use it. So as these new jobs come online, there are going to be new challenges. So these are the kinds of questions that we're going to ask uh, our panel today. Uh, I'd like to ask them to come on up uh, while we take a look at uh, some of the different considerations. We've got the collection of data, again, from a lot of different sources. Uh, we're going to be loading it, maybe using Flume, maybe using some other mechanism. Uh, analyzing this data, and in the analysis, what do you have to track? You have to track the MapReduce jobs, or the PIG, or the Hive jobs, or uh, the disk utilization, CPU utilization, all those kinds of things. Uh, once you're done with it, you might need to take that data and load it into another system, and you need to make sure this happens on a regular basis, maybe daily, maybe every few hours, depending on what your business requirements are. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce our, our panel. Um, so if we can have them come up. So um, first of all, we have uh, Sean Sukter. Uh, we have Emal Kekre. And we have Eric Volstater. And we have a series of questions here that we want to ask. And I'm kind of just kind of rotate through these over a period of time here. So with uh, uh, the first question, uh, very simple one, uh, what's your name, company, what do you do? So we'll start with Eric. Hi, my name is Eric Wallstetter. Uh, I'm a data pipeline engineer at Altiscale. Um, so, I mean, Altiscale is a Hadoop as a service offering. Um, we provide uh, Hadoop operations all the way from bare metal up to application support. 
um, for you know the entire Apache Hadoop ecosystem, Hive, Pig. Um, I'm focused on the reason I'm here at a big data monitoring panel is because as a data pipeline engineer, I'm responsible for ingesting all of the operations data, machine logs that are produced by um, the operation of Hadoop for our customers. Um, so I am I am a software developer, not a um, op ops person or an SRE. So I have a little bit of a different take on you know what it means to monitor big data than maybe someone who's monitoring the um, system level metrics um, for um, Hadoop systems. Does this work? Yeah. Yep. Uh, my name is Sean Suchter. I am the CEO and co-founder of Pepperdata and uh, the janitor and every, I spent most of my day-to-day -day working on our dev tool setup. So there you go. Uh, but we, of, as a company, are extremely interested in what happens with monitoring uh, big data systems. Uh, you know, we you know, one of the big things that is very challenging when you move to these big data systems, uh, as Young was talking about, is you have a lot of different things running on the same, uh, you know, hardware. The hardware may, may be heterogeneous, which makes it more complicated. The software may be heterogeneous because now you suddenly have, instead of one thing on a server, you have 30 things on a server or 50 things on a server, and any one of those can be the... Uh, the culprit and stomp on each other and so that you know identifying and then automatically solving that uh, so monitoring and then rectifying is is really important to what uh, pepper data is all about this works cool uh, my name is Amol Kekre um, again CTO and janitor etc of uh, data torrent um, we um, we are very complimentary to pepper data but we are a native yarn application that runs completely in yarn it's a fast big data pipeline processing uh, uh, engine. And the good thing we have is it's fully fault tolerant enterprise quality. We actually pride ourselves in getting customers to launch in six months as opposed to longer time. And uh, it's fully fault tolerant. So what I'll discuss today is what our customers have done to monitor and operationalize their apps. What all they do to make sure the apps is running, the SLAs are met, if there's something going on, can they come in and fix stuff and so on and so forth. And uh, our customers have used us in a variety of ways to get that done. And as a result of that, we have added a lot of features uh, into our platform that lets you actually monitor custom data, custom metrics of the app, application level custom metrics as is, and leverage Hadoop for spooling the data, keeping it there, alerting it, and integrating with other software. And it has been very instrumental and important for them to be able to do that because when they launch an app, uh, the business logic takes them 20-30% of the time, but 70% of the time is spent actually making sure it's optimizable, it's, it's supportable, and so on and so forth. And we have very strong features uh, in that area. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, I'll pose a second question to Sean to start with. Um, can you tell us about your big data environment? Uh, how many servers, maybe how many individual implementations, what systems do you have in place? Yeah, so, so for us, I mean, of course, we're a uh, you know, technology provider. And so the most interesting environment to talk about is our, uh, our customers' uh, big data environment because they're, you know, that, you know, we're providing technology that helps them deal with those. So we, like we last estimated it, we have our stuff running on a, somewhere around uh, 10,000 uh, tart, you know, Hadoop nodes. Uh, that we've got, you know, licensed usage of our stuff. Uh, the they're typically in clusters from. Uh, I think our median is probably hundreds, hundreds of node clusters. There's a few that are thousands, and then you know, uh, you know, uh, some that are sub a hundred. They tend to be using. Uh, we're seeing about a. Uh, you know, we're it's we're in the middle of the transition between classic, you know, MapReduce only stuff and Yarn, where you know people are using Yarn, and when they go to Yarn, they're starting with just MapReduce, so they're you know they want to monitor you know what's going on with you know all the MapReduce applications, but then they're starting to get more interesting things like you know, you know the data torrents entire entire product line and and. Uh, you know they're running Spark alongside of those things, and so you know you're starting to get into an extremely, uh, you know, software-wise uh, challenging environment where there's multiple tenants on these things, and you really have to look at each guy 
to see, okay, well, what the heck is going on in this cluster? Okay. Uh, so V2 are, in fact, we are very much like Pepper Data. V2 are a technology provider. Uh, we have our own 14 node grid that we develop on. Uh, I think uh, me too, for me too, it's the customer grids. Uh, we have 1,000 node grid, a uh, few hundreds, and a lot of 20 node grids. Uh, and unlike Pepper Data, which has to uh, monitor the whole grid, uh, we are actually exactly like a map list job. Uh, you, you go to Yarn, you launch a job, you might take 50 nodes out of 1,000, we might take 20 nodes out of 100 or whatever. So it's completely Yarn container based. Uh, uh, we don't even uh, worry about the Yarn monitoring, whether it's Cloud or Pepper Data is a great add-on for us. Um, for us, the monitoring is more in terms of amount of data you process, the kind of time you take, the kind of latency you take, uh, what kind of memory you use, uh, number of hash keys you have, uh, you know, what's, is it delayed right now, how long it take, took you to load your data into Oracle, and so on and so forth. So we are very much into uh, application, uh, application level monitoring, and, uh, you know, so. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, so uh, I don't want to break the trend. So again, we are you know a technology provider for companies that are running Hadoop. We don't um, you know specialize in running Hadoop ourselves, although we do run Hadoop um, for our own ETL processes um, for um, analyzing our monitoring data. Um, so we have data center. We use data centers on the West and East Coast, um, which have um, direct connection to AWS, so that you can, if you have you know, some of your operations in AWS, it's really easy to get your data in and out of AltiScale. Um, our customers require, you know, an, um, a lot of different heterogeneous packages from the uh, Apache Hadoop ecosystem, Hadoop, different versions of Hadoop, Spark, Hive, Tez, uh, Uzi, Pig. Um, so we, we mostly try to use the open source versions of uh, Apache products. Um, when um, supporting our customers. We also have some custom data transfer tools that we've developed in-house to make transferring data um, between AWS and uh, AltiScale easier. Um, in terms of things like nodes, um, you know, mo our customers are running you know, anywhere from 20 to 300 node clusters. So altogether, you know, we, we're running thousands of nodes, probably not 10,000s of nodes, and um, you know, definitely running peta uh, storing petabytes of data for all of our customers. Thank you. Okay, and uh, so Emil, I'm going to ask you the next question, which is uh, what you're using big data for. And I realize all three of you, it, it's mainly a, a service more than or, or uh, uh, more for your customers than anything else. But if you can tell us what the patterns are in terms of how your customers are using the data. Uh, okay, uh, fair enough. So. Um, uh, general trend wise we are very heavy in uh, ad industry we are heavy in telcos iot and we just just started to get into financial sector uh, our use cases are very actually similar um what uh, what we're solving some problems that not problems we're making life easier in hadoop today uh, a lot of, almost all our customers ingest data using us whether it's from kafka database uh, nfs ftp it doesn't matter uh, they're able to ingest it completely as is fully in order they do then you know error checking etl uh, analytics uh, and then they do some actions and then you load it into some database or wherever so we are effectively a fast big data pipeline processing platform um, and all use cases are different uh, semantics of it i mean somewhere you have you know uh, you know 20 mega 20 uh, gbps per second and somewhere you don't somewhere the tuples are pretty huge somewhere they're not but that's a common pa pattern we have and uh, eric um, yeah, again, so since we're a Hadoop as a service, um, I actually, I took a little bit of time to go through our list of customers and try to kind of categorize some of the verticals that they are, are in. Um, so I've got a laundry list here. I'm just going to read it real fast. So ad tech, market intelligence, Wi-Fi coverage optimization, consumer profiling, mobile gaming, political anal analytics, web media, vendor management systems, supply chain analytics, uh, VC research. Uh, so this is venture capitalist research, uh, finance, and high performance trading. So th those were the rough categories. Um, maybe it would have been shorter if you said what they don't do. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and Sean? Yeah, so, I mean, we have a, you know, there, there's a similarly wide set of, of customer usages. Uh, 
but the dominant and and we are you know like our actual product you know recursively also uses Hadoop again because the, to actually serve our performance dashboards we actually store the data in an H base so we we have to monitor and and you know maintain that the dominant feature for that we see in our customers and and of course ourselves too is that they're using Hadoop in a production oriented way they they actually have SLAs they you know you want your job has to happen on time. Your you know H base has to have a latency. You want to run Spark and not take down the rest of the grid. Um, you know that the the unifying feature of all of you know our usage and all of our customers' usage is really that it's it's got some kind of production grade uh, reliability requirement, and it's very different than if you're just uh, just using it for backend analytics. Okay. Great, um, and that's probably a good intro into the next one, which is um, uh, how you monitor your environment today, and you know what tools do you use. Um, so I think uh, we're starting with Eric again. Um, so I'm, in terms of monitoring, I think that the kind of the base level that you need to cover is time series and uh, metrics, uh, things that like the uh, Hadoop two metrics that are being produced by Hadoop. Um, to tell you how many jobs have failed per hour, how many um, containers are being used, how much memory is being used. Um, and you can feed this into a number of tools. We use Graphite. Um, Graphite has a very uh, flexible query language. Um, it has a lot of similarities with another tool that you may have heard of, uh, Ganglia. These are tools which use a round robin database so that the uh, fidelity of the metrics in the most recent period is very high so you can get like second level granularity for the last day but then the database over time it will age out metrics but still um, um, preserve the aggre aggregate of those metrics um, by rolling up um, to different um, time periods okay. uh, um, so so that covers graphite Hadoop metrics too. Um, for business intelligence, we do um, uh, ETL on these metrics and uh, logs that we collect from uh, Hadoop, and then we create a, a star schema uh, with the facts and measures um, so that we can plug uh, Tableau or uh, any number of business intelligence tools, um, other ones um, that are coming out like at scale, uh, data mirror, uh, MicroStrategy was was a, was a popular one, um, and these allow people who are maybe not Hadoop operations people, but people who want to get kind of insights into customer activity. It allows them to get have a nice view of the system. Okay, great, thank you, um, Sean. Yeah. Okay. So so the the things that that we and our customers tend to look at there's. There's things that I, I kind of say are the the most basic things, which is, you know, like the node level metrics, how busy, you know, you, you should definitely be looking at how, you know, how busy are your computes, how busy are your networks are, you know, how, you know, how busy are your disks and your memory. So, so those are kind of like, you know, that's, you know, your, your, you know, just anti uh, for the stakes. The next level is is there's some useful information and honestly a lot of noise uh in the uh jmx data that the various hadoop demons output um but there's a lot of useful stuff to look at there uh one of the things of course you know big value adds the pepper data does uh that uh is you know quite a bit useful to you know in the specific you know metrics and monitoring front is to look at the individual applications right so we are actually watching uh, the CPU, the RAM, the disk, the network, and you know the garbage collections and, and other things in an application-specific way. So we're actually you know, watching the individual containers, so you can actually see things like you know oh well it's it's you know when your disks blew up of the thirty things that were running at this instant, it was these two that were trying to use the disk, and this one is different than the last time it ran. Uh, that's uh, been a very useful thing to try to diagnose well. When your disks get busy every hour, is it just because that just kind of happens, or oh, it's that one job, he did it. Hmm. Um, that that's been a, a very useful thing for us in, in many axes. Okay, so um, so here we here data differs a little bit. We have moved up the stack, uh, kind of complementary to Pepperita. 
but uh, what our pl platform is is effectively provides you ability to write any Java you want, right? Any kind of code, it just runs, right? Which be basically means that uh, customers want to monitor all kinds of stuff, which we don't know of, but they will decide that. Like I could monitor a number of keys in my hash table, or whatever, right? So what we provide uh, is uh, all our customers have the monitoring systems they integrate with it. But what we provide for them is web services for accessing all data that they create. All they do is write a take an interface and write a particular function call. We'll collect it. We'll collect custom metrics, their own schema on per second basis. We'll take it. We'll spool it into HDFS all the way back till the HDFS fills up. On that, you can query per day, per month, whatnot. And at any given time, you have web service to get data per operator, per container, total aggregate, and so on and so forth. And we also provide you know, number of tuples, latency, all built in. But the beauty of our platform is that you can basically sort of monitor whatever the hell you want. Uh, it can be it can be data to load Oracle, it can be whatever. And we provide the interface for the web services, for storage, and all of it, uh, which makes life very, very good. Because uh, in terms of giving the SLA and to do a root cause analysis, on your application, you know exactly what's going on. Um, and then along with, say, something like Pepper Data, uh, you can actually monitor the whole whole grid. OK, great. Um, and I think we kind of have uh, five wrapped into four as well. So I'm, I'm going to skip that in the interest of time here um, and move on to question number six, which is, what have you found are the least important things to monitor? I know for myself, when I've managed systems in the past, I thought something was really important, but it turned out it wasn't. And I was just, you know, chasing something blindly for, for no reason. So uh, are, are there things that you have found that uh, are, are actually not as useful as you think? So Sean, I'll, I'll pose that to you. Yeah, OK. So so there's a couple that we were just thinking about recently that we were looking at. So uh, one of the things that we were trying to look at it at, you know, for our, you know, the, our customers, the targeted Hadoop systems is, you know, we try to look for places where they're under or over various red lines. And so uh, we were, one of the things we we're looking at was, you know, hey, are they getting into swapping situations where the, the, the system's actually getting overloaded in some way, uh, you know, in, in the you know, memory working set size uh, and the node starts swapping and then, you know, obviously performance, you know, it's out the window, you have nothing anymore. Um, and so one of the most obvious things to look at there um, is, well, you know, you know and, and we had people who look, you know, who would look at this and they'd say, well, look at how much swap is used, right? It's, it's you know, we have a lot of swap used. And, and it turns out that's uh, almost completely worthless to look at um, because, uh, you know, it was like, well, you know, we had this problem and before, you know, the swap used was down here and we had this problem and now the swap used is up here. So you know, clearly something's wrong there. Um, and uh, it turns out that, uh, it's entirely reasonable to have a lot of swap use as long as it's not changing. So it's much more important in that example to look at how much is moving in or moving out of swap than how much is absolutely used. You can entirely reasonably have a lot of stuff being used as long as a lot is not is uh, not a lot of stuff is moving in or out. Okay. Um, we also found that you know looking at there's a bunch of information that you know a lot of the typical uh, monitoring systems will throw at you like you know how much memory in the kernel is is being used towards this and being used towards this and being used towards this and a lot of that is actually uh, you know you, and you'll see a lot of movements right you'll see this this free memory in the kernel you know move but it you know and you'll see this you know buffers in the kernel move a whole bunch um, and a lot of that is actually just noise uh, because it's not actually correctly weighted by how they're getting used and it's it's only when you're de debugging into a very specific problem and uh, that it's actually important to like look at the movements of those. You get a lot of high fluxes in those without it actually being much of a signal. Okay, great, thank you. That's a great answer, Sean. So uh, in this one, I'm I'm not going to give a good answer because I thought a lot about this question over the last three four days. Uh, partly the reason has been that uh, we have been consistently surprised by our customers in the innovation in, in terms of what they monitor. And we thinking something was not important turned out to be totally false, and we thinking something is important turned out to be otherwise. Luckily for us, since it's plain Java and we let anything go through, it's been fine. But uh, I don't think I'm going to give a good answer in terms of what is not important, because frankly, I don't know. All I can say is I've consistently noticed our customers, uh, they go from SLA, they go from wh why they're doing this app, what's the business, and then derive, derive the metrics. And then they come to completely surprising results for us from, from my side. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Um, so this question will really depend on your um, your network and your uh, setup for your data center. Um, but for us, we have found that rack locality is much less important than you will read about on blogs or on um, you know Hadoop operations books. Um, it makes a lot of sense, you know, if you're someone who's interested in distributed systems, you know, you want to put the computation as close to where the data is so that you reduce data transfer. Um, but when you have such high network bandwidth in the data center, um, the bottleneck is the, the disk I.O., and which completely dominates um, the data transfer over the network in the, in the data center. So if you're doing things like increasing the replication factor of your files on HDFS, to make sure you get increase your rack locality, you may be wasting your time. Okay. In fact, it might be counterproductive because yeah. by increasing the replication, you end up spending the RAM of multiple machines where uh, concentrating the buffering in one machine and serving many guys from the buffer cache out of that machine may be net more efficient period. Now, now, now you said that uh, monitoring the network uh, the network is generally fast enough that you don't have to worry about that so much. Are you, are you talking about single gigabit or 10 gigabit, or it doesn't matter? Um, I mean, it does matter, you know, so like a 10 gigabyte, 10 gigabit, 10 gigabit. connection. Okay, <coughs> good. that's good to know. All right, um, and then the next question uh, for uh, Emil, which is what are some of the challenges with monitoring that you've encountered? Um, has it been very hard to monitor specific things, like there's something you wanted to monitor, but there's just no way of getting it or not getting it accurately? Um, so uh, I think in our case it's a lot more easier because you have some function call functionality being run and you sort of know what you're doing I mean it's like a looking at hash table and looking at number of keys or load time for Oracle we don't face the kind of kind of issues say pepper it or anti scale will face because it really I mean they are they are like monitoring the whole thing uh, we we run in some containers and for customers to uh, uh, to monitor something that they're already doing uh, uh, it's it's not that difficult. The only thing I would add is that uh, we have fo we have found that cus the customers who succeed are one who plan up monitoring and operationalizing while they develop code, not at the time of the launch. Uh, you got to do it as you're doing it, so it goes clean. It gets tested, QA tested, and everything. Uh, but uh, for us, it's a lot more uh, uh, easier than 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 the other two. Okay. And Eric. Um. So a lot of these new systems, uh, compute engines like Tez and Spark are kind of throwing a wrench into the model that we were used to with MapReduce where you have jobs and each job corresponds to um, an application from the resource manager perspective. And so if you're using traditional tools to monitor jobs, um, you, you may find yourself very surprised by wh when you're running something like Tez or Spark. So, the reason this is is because Tez and Spark, they'll open up a session and they'll use that as, a, as one job and they'll use that job as a container for multiple Tez queries or multiple Spark um, workflows. And so it, when, you're moni when you're looking at your, you know, your uh, monitoring dashboard and you see one Spark job that ran for uh, 10 days, you, you know, you're probably confused, why would we have a job that ran for 10 days? But it's actually not a job that ran for 10 days. It's a session that was open for 10 days. And to get insight into what the actual workflows that were run in that is very difficult right now because the tools like Tez and Spark are immature and they don't have as much monitoring support um, as the more traditional tools like MapReduce. So when, you know, people in your company, um, you know, when they get excited about new technologies, one thing that you want to do due diligence on is have those technologies really brought the you know um, mature support for monitoring. Great, great point. Thank you. Um, um, so I was thinking about this. I'll, I'll talk about uh, three challenges that we had. Uh, one that we sidestepped, uh, one that we solved, and one that we're still working on. Uh, so one that was fun in uh, early days, like a, you know for us a couple years ago, was we encountered some uh, you know, bugs, and I think they're in better shape now, but uh, some bugs in the Hadoop counters, uh, Hadoop metric stack, where we would just, uh, we would try to pull the data and we would uh, randomly get the wrong data. 
So you know, you, you you pull a particular counter, and half the time you get the real counter, and half the time you get uh, some other version of the same counter. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was, it was particularly it was particularly challenging in the uh, uh, you know the file system based Hadoop counters. Uh, so that was kind of fun at the time, and and we sidestepped that uh, basically by reproducing the same data in a different way um, <clears throat> that didn't have the same problem. And I think that that's been fixed in the core system. Uh, next one was one that we 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 had a huge challenge with and uh, we solved, which was basically because we're producing uh, data and we're measuring each individual container uh, and producing time series about each individual container, not just you know the whole node and the whole JMX data, these containers are extremely ephemeral. And all of the systems like the, you know, uh, the, you know, all the round robin database, you know, based systems are basically expecting very long running time series where, you know, you may have a thousand metrics on a node, but kind of that node, you know, is alive for a very long time, like, you know, you know, days, weeks, years, something like that. And so, you know, you can have one database that just, you know, has a thousand things and you measure it. But when you have these ephemeral little things that last for, you know, 30 seconds or two minutes, and then you have, you know, hundreds of thousands of those per day, you know, you can't really build an RRD based system that, you know, works in an efficient way uh, when you're turning over RRDs every single, you know, every single hour, it, it, it breaks their model. Uh, and so we had to do a lot of work to uh, scale to the huge number of tasks that we deal with. And then also on top of that, uh, scale to a huge number of nodes, right? So we had, you know, we were doing this on, you know, thousands of nodes uh, with, you know, probably million, you know, I probably need to add another zero, uh, millions of tasks per day or tens of million. You know, it was just huge numbers of things that we, you know, had to aggregate in lots of different ways and deal with efficiently. So that was a real challenge that we had to solve and, you know, we're, we're very good at it. A challenge that we are still uh, working on uh, constantly is a way to extract uh, more, you know, actionable meaning out of it. Uh, it's really helpful to be able to look at individual real things to determine the root causes, but it's still an interesting challenge when you have a lot of different things flying around. What is the actual meaning here, right? You know, which metrics should you look at? Which of the guys that that cause, you know, like, you know, hey. Ignore the fact that uh, there's a lot of swap memory used. Look at the you know look at the amount that's coming in and out. Um, put a big you know big flashing red thing in front of the thing that's a problem and, and highlight the worst thing. So we've got some of that functionality, but that's going to be a lot more working for us and, and for other people too. You know, finding the uh, the signal in in all of this huge volume of data. Okay, and then uh, question number eight, which I think we're back to Eric now. Um, has monitoring affected your ability to enhance the performance of your system? And I think, you know, for me, this is one of the most interesting ones because if you can't really measure and monitor your system, it's, it's hard to know how to improve it. Right, so, I mean, there, as a, again, as a software developer, there's a lot of things going on at the systems level that you could tune that I'm not an expert in, um, so our, you know, our operations team would be doing that for you. But as a user of Hadoop, the most important thing to me is to balance the um, uh, number of mappers and reducers that I, um, are launched for a particular job and the yarn container sizes that I, I choose to to use. Um, the problem with choosing a yarn container yarn container sizes is that. Um, once you fix the size of the container uh, before you launch your job, um, that much memory is going to be claimed by um, the resource manager for the duration of the job, regardless of whether maybe a particular mapper doesn't even really need that much memory. Mm -hmm. So um, profiling jobs to see how much actual JVM heap space is needed in the, biz in the application logic for the mappers and the reducers before you then go and put um, some fi fixed parameter for uh, yarn container sizes uh, has been really crucial for me to be able to get the most out of a cluster where you know I don't have infinite capacity. Um, another thing that is important for us um, uh, as, as a kind of DB, 
DBMS administrators for our customers that are running Hive are to understand why their Hive queries are taking an enormously am a long amount of time. And I, th I think the problem here stems from the fact that Hive users don't realize the immaturity of Hive and they think that the Hive optimizer is going to work just as well as Oracle. It's going to work just as well as MySQL. They don't need to worry about the join order. They don't need to worry about um, which columns they are using uh, for indexing. Um, and so our, we have another team, an applications engineering team, which monitors the SQL queries that our customers run to make sure that they're doing thing, doing you know, very simple things like actually using the indexes that were set up for them, or um, uh, actually, um, uh, you know, running explain plan on the queries to make sure that that, that Hive isn't generating a a, a uh, plan which is completely, um, um, it, you know, um, suboptimal. Which you may think of won't happen because Hi you know Hive is a very popular uh, product, and in this community we talk about Hive, but it's still very immature. In, com in comparison to other uh, uh, relational database products. Okay, thank you. Sean? So there are a couple different ways that I can look at this. Um, you know, one is how, you know, our software, you know, part of what, you know, obviously the, the, the Pepper Data software is so focused on performance is, is that it's, you know, monitoring the system then actively changing the behavior of the system to make it more performance. That's a big part of our point. So, you know, you, you pick the perfect example for me, like the, the, the act of trying to, you know, prescribe exactly the correct container sizes or whatever, you know, well, you know, we watch that and, and then we, you know, adjust to deal with exactly what the, you know, the containers are using in, in memory and, and other things, right, CPU and disk and network to make the system act optimally for what they're actually using, not what you pre-configured. So that's kind of like a very active loop of monitoring and making the system perform better. There's also the ways in which we've improved the uh, the algorithms that we've used, right? You know, this is, you know, we look at all of this telemetry that, that is being produced and, you know, for, you know, about all these applications and we, we change, you know, we remodel our algorithms, you know, based upon this. And so that's another loop. And then there's also, the, the system that we actually run, right? So for example, you know, like our HBase where we're serving these, you know, uh, dashboard metrics. And one of the things we uh, got a lot of value at there is is comparing different metrics. So we compared, for example, the, uh, the rates of data coming in to the actions that we saw the HBase doing. And, you know, we looked at those and said, this doesn't make sense, right? One of these is an order of magnitude off from the other. There's something, you know, funny going on. And we basically nailed it down to uh, compactions of various sorts. And we were able to say, oh, okay, you know, let's let's put a custom coproc in here. And, and it, you know, dramatically changed the performance of the thing. And it was basically by looking at the monitoring system and just doing back the envelopes about do these metrics does the value of this compare reasonably to the value of that? And, and you know, it didn't. So there must be something to dig in there. Uh, so in terms of this question, we we really, really do this a lot. Uh, uh, well, I would say uh, it is for us, uh, monitoring is a first class citizen and is extremely critical. Uh, almost all our customers do a whole bunch of stuff. And we have a lot of tools that I'll talk about now that help you. For example, we have this concept of application package. So you do your business logic, you package it, and then you say, I can run it with configuration one, two, three, four, five. In fact, we had one customer run 10 configurations, which includes different container sizes, different partitions, different combinations. If you have 20 operators, you know, 16 may have four partitions, or you try two partitions or whatever. And then you run all of them for like a month, you do a diff and whatnot, and we manage all of that for you. And all of that is backed up into HGFS. Uh, we also have these tests where you go around killing every operator. You just go and just shoot kill to minus nine, all of them, bunch of them, and uh, the uh, the platform ensures you methodologist for you to test that the results are exactly identical. Uh, in fact, uh, with one of our early customers, Fortune 10 co company, uh, they went through all these tests for two months, and we are going to launch uh, like uh, in a couple of weeks. So we went there and said, okay, everything is done, and they came back and said, well, you know, you guys claim fault tolerance, uh, and we have this problem with Hadoop. When we restart Hadoop, when we upgrade or whatever, you know, we shut down everything. Uh, we kill all the jobs and it's a headache because then you start Hadoop back again, then you have to remember what to start and you know, Uzi, this, that, whatever, right? And uh, we said, well, we are a Hadoop native application. When you kill Hadoop, you're dead. What are you talking about? Like, 
what, what do you expect us to do? So they said, well, you know, if you are fault tolerant and you claim you can come back after operator outages, why don't you come back after the whole app outage? So we got that to work. Effectively, we took the whole app snapshot and I, I called it the lunch test because I assumed that by the time you get paged that the road, node, no, name node or resource manager is down, you wake up in the night, you come to work, you know, log in or whatever, it takes you one hour. So I told them, kill Hadoop, go take your lunch, come back, then you restart your name node, whatever time it takes, you restart your node manager, and start my application pointing back to the snapshot of the old application that doesn't even exist in your namespace. And it worked. So uh, it took us a few weeks, but we really, really, really are enterprise quality. We, uh, as I said, 70% of the time is spent making sure everything works, checked off, everything is fine. And we have a lot of tools like app packages, lunch test, kill operators. Uh, you can actually try everything out before you say, I want that particular combination to go to production. And when it goes to production, you can absolutely predict what it will do. The problem we also have is, you know, we are sharing a multi-tenant, you know, that's why Paper Duck comes in. But uh, if you run, run these different configurations for a couple of months, you're more or less sure which one wins uh, because, you know, you, you have your results, all of them are pulled into HDFS, you can diff it and go forward. Yeah. Uh, all right, thank you. And uh, so this one is for Sean. Um, so what surprising things have you encountered in monitoring your environment? And um, for, for me at least, because we've gone through a lot of questions here, uh, maybe if you can make that humorous, that would be better. Oh, all right. Okay, so I, I like this, this, this thing that happened to us a couple of years ago. Um, it was one of our first betas. Uh, and uh, I, I kind of alluded to it a little bit, but I should tell a little more of the story. Um, and, and then I'll, I'll, I'll tell one more too after that. Uh, both humorous. So uh, this was one. Uh, it was one of our you know, early betas, and we had just gotten we had just gotten the the visualization layer, the dashboard, to work. So we were monitoring all these individual applications, and we just gotten the layer to work. And this customer had told us, well, you know, it, you know, we, we think our customer is is disk bound because every time you know it seems to have a problem, we look at it and the 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 disks are busy. And it's like, okay, well that sounds reasonable. And it turns out actually that it wasn't. Uh, really disk bound. It just you know every you know hour or so the disks got really busy, uh, and so you know we you know and they had just kind of internalized that you know well that's what happens. Our cluster is disk bound. There's a lot of people using things. The disks are busy, so uh, we had this you know nice visualization, and and for the first time we were actually able to to zoom in to look at the individual jobs that were using the disks, and so we you know we said well let's look at one of those spikes, and we're doing this like interactively. Here at, at you know I mean in a conference room with you know you know probably uh, you know a fifth the number of people who are here and you know so all of the people you know big part of the people who are submitting expensive jobs to this cluster and they're they're looking and they're you know and so we zoom into one of these peaks and we you know break it up by job and we you know it's and break it up by user and it's like and I didn't know all these people and um, you know they're they're you know half of them are engaged and half of them are on their laptops just you know doing whatever and and uh, we say well it's you know it turns out that that all of these spikes are actually this one the, this one user and and his user ID is is so and so um, and it turns out the guy's sitting right here on his laptop and and I say, and and the entire room goes to look at him because <laughs> they've been living with this for years um, so they they go to look at him and and he goes. Wait, what? <laughs> Could you tell me the job idea that I want to look? <laughs> um, so that you know that that was a, a a you know fun surprise you know to to everyone involved that it was like oh it was one thing that did it. So the the other one was and this is from super early days and I I, I see a couple people in the room here who might remember this. This is in uh, two thousand uh, I can't remember if it's two thousand six or two thousand seven. This is like early, early, early days of Hadoop. Uh, so we're back at Yahoo, and uh, we're running. You know, this is you know one of the very the you know one of the very first deployments. Uh, this was in one of the search uh, you know search applications in the search data center. Uh, so my team's doing web search, and it's important to understand the geometry here, right? Uh, we're in the Mission College you know campus of Yahoo. The search team is on the eighth floor, and the uh, Hadoop team was on the sixth floor at the time. Uh, so we're, um, the search engine is trying to serve queries and it's, uh, trying to serve, you know, it needs like 50 megabits to get its 10 blue links in and out. Uh, and Hadoop, somebody did an entirely reasonable Hadoop job, entirely reasonable. And this is all gigabit networks at the time, uh, that consumed a gigabit. And these were on the same core switch. 
So it's a shared resource. And of course, you know, suddenly the, the search engine cannot get packets in and out. So we have a live site issue on yahoo.com, you know, search to yahoo.com. Mm. Uh, and it took us a little, you know, a little while to figure this out. There's like, you know, a few minutes, right? You know, we're like, we're not getting queries in and out. And we were very surprised because this is the first time we'd ever seen that it was actually because of, uh, you know, network contention that we'd actually seen our, our searching go down because we don't need any network, right? You know, 15 megabytes, nothing. Uh, and uh, so, you know, after we figured this out, which was a huge surprise, then there was like a horde of people running down from the eighth floor to the sixth floor, basically saying, stop whatever you're doing. Yeah. Uh, and that was, you know, it's, you know and, and, you know, the whole thing was about 12 minutes or so, which was a really big deal for us at the time. <laughs> okay. So you, you took down Yahoo for 12 minutes. Not, not all, just, just search. That's a pretty big portion yeah, yeah. of Yahoo. Yeah, well, okay. it, it was not all of Yahoo. It was just the part that made money. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. <laughs> okay. And Emil? Uh, I don't have stories as funny, but I have two. Uh, <laughs> uh, one, one brought down the site also. So one is uh, one of our early customers. Uh, you know, we have this monitoring that tells you how many contents went down, when, what, why. And they called us and said, you know, something's wrong with your platform. Every two hours, this container, this operator is dying. And we're like, damn, how can that be? So we went in there, we, you know, we went to the code, we did that, and we came back and said, well, you know, you have a memory leak. It leaks memory, you know, and then it dies. So fix it. And he said, well, wait a minute. My results are still the same because you come back up and you restart, and my, my app is doing the same thing. So it's not really high priority because I mean, I'm going to spend time to, like, fix a memory leak that just, I mean, since you recover. It's just surprising because memory leak would usually make people go all over the place. Uh, in terms of... Uh, uh, site outage. Uh, I used to run Yahoo Finance, Financial.com. It's a internet site. So um, I don't know whether you guys remember the Pentium bug. Um, you know, Pentium had an issue. So a file used to give us hardware, and he, we are like, we would always take 50, 100 servers and whatnot, and uh, we we took this early version of uh, this thing, and uh, I was I was like. Every day I would lose 10 servers, 15 servers, 12 servers, and I was go going nuts because we're waking up, taking them to rotation. Sometimes load balancer would do it themselves, and then I sent a nasty email to Philo. I said, here's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. For the last one month, every node has gone down. And I said, this are, this are new new server, something's wrong, please test. And he was saying, no, I mean, you guys are doing something, something, blah, blah, blah. Then after like a couple of days, I got an email from him saying that the Intel confirmed some problems. Uh, there's something wrong, so don't worry. Just Remove the servers, I'll put something in. And about four months later, they confirmed the bug. So, you know, mm, that's fine. Yeah. It's interesting, because I remember hearing about the bug, but I never heard of anyone actually having problems in production. And okay. That, that was a pretty nasty email to follow. But he kept saying, I'm dreaming, and that's not true, and blah, blah, blah. Right. And then I sent and I copied a whole bunch of people, then he didn't respond. And then after two days, he had escalated and confirmed <laughs> okay. uh, something was wrong. Thank you. OK. And uh, Eric? OK, so this these stories aren't that funny to me because they <laughs> happen to me um, maybe, maybe we'll find them entertaining and, and actually and, and in hindsight um, it's kind of it's very obvious because if you read a book like on data warehousing they'll usually tell you in the first chapter don't throw anything away but Hadoop has a lot of preset parameters for retention periods for when logs get thrown away like the job history logs get thrown away after 30 days and if you're not paying attention to that they just disappear after 30 days. Um, so I've happened, this has happened to me a couple times. Uh, once the CEO came to me and said, we have this customer and they want to brag about how many HDFS bytes they read and write every week um, because they want to show that, that they're more scalable to that than their other customers. And I say to him, we, don't, we, th we, th we threw that data away. We don't have that data, you know? And, um, and then he get, I get one of these. And the CEO running, walking out into the other room, which is never a good feeling for you know a software engineer. And then a few, and then a few months later, um, the pro our product manager comes to us and he says, you know, we're supporting too many different product distributions. We've got Hive, we've got Pig, we've got Cascading, we've got Cascalog. So we've got, and our support engineers are uh, can't keep up with all of this. So we need to know which of these applications are being used the most. And then we're just going to cut out the ones that aren't that important. And this data, you know, we can find this data in the, something called the job XML, um, which in our um, default parameters gets aged out after 30 days. So I say to the product manager, I don't know. 
I can tell you for the last 30 days, but I don't really have that data, um, uh, so I can't help you. So, you know, this uh, with things like Glacier on S and S3 and the, the how cheap disks are these days, you should just keep all, I recommend just keep all the data. You may need it at some point. Get it on Glacier. Um, Amazon will put it on a tape somewhere. It'll be like that. I don't know if you've ever seen um, Raiders of the Lost Ark, where at the, in the last scene they put the Ark in this <laughs> warehouse, never to be seen again. But just in case you ever need that that Ark, it's there for you in that uh, in storage. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. And then uh, question number ten, uh, which uh, I'm trying to remember who we're back to. I think it's Emil. Uh, do you have any t uh, tricks, tips, or best practices uh, that you've learned? And uh, you know. I think this is going to be of most interest to people that already have some production level experience with, with Adobe. Um, yeah, I do. And this comes also from Yahoo Finance. Uh, two things. One is you, you got to treat monitoring and operability as first class citizens. I mean, of every big data, any real products we have done, 10%, if I'm really lenient, 20% is business logic. 80% is getting it to run, not getting paged, keeping it up there and not have your CTO, CEO, or whoever it is get pissed off when something's done happen. You have to have your, your operability and everything baked in from the start. There's no such thing as I have something, some platform I'm using and I'm going to slap something in later. It doesn't don't work that way. It has to be in your, uh, in the platform, it has to be in your application, it has to be done while you code it. You, you can't launch and then say, wait a minute, let me go do something about it. Uh, for me and even for Yahoo Finance and in Hadoop, uh, business logic is just, you know, 20% is I'm really lenient here, right? Uh, and that's what it takes. That's what it takes to be 24 by seven. That's what it takes to be, you know, world class. That's what it takes to be, you know, going down. And there's there's no shortcuts. You have to do that. Number one. Number two. This again, I've learned over, um, uh, and I hope folks, I mean, especially Sean agrees with this. If you have, a I mean, a lot of projects have data flow. You have front end. You collect logs. You you know, aggregate somewhere. Then you put it into Hadoop. Then you copy it out. You have Oracle and whatnot, right? So if you take this flow and if you have, let's say, I'm comparing two flows, right? And one flow has 20 technologies in it stack. So Hadoop is one. Just one grid. When I say uh, uh, technology, I mean a cluster, right? And if other has four, the operability of uh, a four cluster, a four circle data flow is exponentially cheaper and easier than a 21. In fact, when you go from four to six, it's like throwing eggs in the air. The lesser you throw, the better, right? So you have yarn now, you have, you can do a whole bunch of native yarn stuff and you can, if you can absorb away clusters to, to do something in, please do it because having a whole bunch of clusters that you go through, uh, makes operability and support horribly wrong. It's uh, it's just harder to do. So two things I would say is one, treat your monitoring and operability as first class citizen, do it from day one. And secondly, if you can come up with a solution that has less hops to go through, the better. It, it really makes your life very, very better. Uh, it doesn't matter how good a hop is. It's still an egg in the air, and in the end of the day, it's, you cannot do a trapeze act. You cannot live a life where you get paid at two o'clock in the night and do something. It should just work by design. And you do that by having less eggs to throw. Okay, thank you. Eric? Um, so, let's see, I have a couple here, but I'm going to pick, um, make your, if you're like a, an ops person or an SRE, make your software developers consider, consider monitoring and making your life easier to monitor um, the applications they build. Um, they need to build things like um, heartbeats or counters into their, um, into their applications that you can then feed into um, a database like Graphite to monitor the health of their application. Um, another example would be, um, by default, most Hadoop applications, Hive, for example, they will give very cryptic job names to the jobs that are launched. And inevitably, at least in our s situation, customers will come to us and say, I want to see all of the all of these jobs that ran in the past 30 days and you and you say well I can't I don't know what all of these jobs are because when I look at the job name that comes out that comes in from the Hadoop log I see job you know one two three four job four five eight two job six two nine seven but there is a way to give a job a name um, it depends on the framework um, you know, if you're launching Hadoop from the command line, it's just a, a minus D 
you know, a, a Java parameter that you can specify a job and make sure that the, when they when they job when they run jobs that are semantically identical to them in their mind, make them give them the same name, and then you can provide them statistics about those jobs. Okay, thank you, and Sean. Let's see. I'll I'll give a couple different things that we've learned over the last uh, last few years uh, doing this. One uh, is uh, make sure you couple different ones make first make sure you can tell the you know always be asking the question if something breaks whatever you're going to be doing if it breaks how will I ever know mm -hmm. right and that's kind of in the same line as a way to ask the question uh, that you know may build in some monitoring it's like okay I think something might break here how will I ever know if that happens and, and it's part building the monitoring and it's also part building in a way that like it's not going to be sitting in some counter off the edge here that nobody ever looks at right is there going to be some way that I know uh, if I'm worried about this risk that if this thing breaks I'll, I'll find a way to know uh, another one is make sure you can tell the difference between your metric and your monitoring system being broken and reporting a zero value Right, because a lot of the time people build systems that, you know, like if you have no data, it reports, you know, it shows up as a zero line versus you have, you know, valid zero data. It shows up as a flat zero line. And those are massively different situations. And so make sure that you can tell the difference between those two. Uh, and the third thing, and this was this is uh, a little more subtle, but but I would encourage people to do it. Whatever your monitoring system, make sure you understand the math that it's doing on your data, right? <laughs> what you know, what does it do when there's missing data points? How is it, you know, is it is it showing you a gap? Is it interpolating in some way? Is it averaging over a larger window? You know, what happens when some node is missing, right? Can you tell that a node is missing or you know, does it show up as a gap, right? Does it show up as a dip? Does it, you know, you know, or you know what? Ha you know how is it averaging your data, right? Because you'll see these things where if you if it's averaged in a way you don't understand, you'll either see phantoms or miss real things. And so you really want to understand what math your monitoring system is doing before the data that you look at. You know what what you're looking at. Okay, thank you. And it, it does sound like there are probably some interesting stories along those lines at at some point in the past. Oh. Yeah, I, I could have picked some of those. <laughs> okay. So for the last question, uh, which is, uh, you know, regarding future plans for improving your ability to monitor, I just want to um, uh, couch that in, in terms of, uh, is, is there specific things that you've run into where you really feel like, I, I wish I'd had a tool? Are there things that you've wanted to integrate it into that you haven't before? Um, and, and those are the things that I think are, are important for people trying to put these sorts of systems into production. Uh, so I'll, I'll ask Eric uh, the, to answer this first. Um, so first this is going to be a plug for Pepper Data and then I'm going to talk about if you're not using Pepper Data what you need to think about. Um, in, in, any, in, <laughs> okay. in any kind in any <laughs> In any mon in, whenever you're monitoring something, you're going to be monitoring a lot of individual things, and those things are going to have relationships to each other. I come from a database background. If you come from a database background, you know all of your tables, while they are conceptually um, uh, conceptually individual units, there's some relationships between each other, and SQL allows us to join them in many different ways, to combine them, to traverse through the thing. So if I'm looking at a particular user, maybe in Hadoop, I want to look at what are all the jobs that they ran. And then I see all the jobs that they ran, and then I see a particular job, and I want to see what are all the nodes that this job ran on. And then I see all the nodes that that, 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 that job ran on. And then I want to look at uh, what are all of the, the jobs, what are all of the users that have run jobs on these nodes. This kind of traversal of, through your monitoring data is extremely valuable. You'll, I, while it's possible to be to pull up, you know, a hundred different log files and write some kind of aux said giant gargantuan monster of a terrible thing to grab this data together. You need to make it easy for yourself. So if you're not using something like Pepper Data, you whenever you are 
introduce a new monitoring source into your system, you need to think, what are the join keys that this source has with the other data that I have? You know, does, uh, and for an example, in a Hadoop data node log, you will get a, um, a task attempt ID, but that task attempt ID won't be able, won't tell you which job um, was, was, was retrieving the data node. And if I look at the resource manager log, I don't see anything about task attempt IDs. I see container ID, yarn container IDs. Now how do I map from a yarn container ID to a task attempt ID? Well, the job history file, jhist file, has a mapping between the container ID and the task attempt ID. And so I can traverse all of these uh, relationships to answer the question of which job was the one which was accessing this block on the, in the data node, but if I haven't planned that into my system, it's going to be very difficult for someone to be doing this um, manually. Okay, thank you. Sean? Uh, so, I mean, there's a lot of stuff, you know, that, that we're looking at adding. Um, you know, we just released, you know, we obviously we've been doing MapReduce stuff, you know, for a while. Uh, we just released uh, doing our monitoring and control features for Spark. Um, you know, we're, we do it for HBase. Uh, you know, things that I think are going to be really interesting in the future is to look at uh, more, you know, more different frameworks and also look into a little more deeply into application specific things and, and arbitrary applications. Like one of the things that I think is really interesting is, is you know, picking on uh, data torrent, for example, there's a lot of really interesting applications that are coming in to the yarn universe, right? And, and you know, it's, it's, you know, obviously really great for the whole Hadoop world that, you know, uh, you know, yarn is is you know here to stay, and there's lots of different applications. You know, thank thanks for it and works, guys. Uh, uh, um, there's a lot of um, applications that are coming in that are very high value, like this. Um, that you know, we're going to be very interested in in looking at how all of those different applications are interplaying you know on these multi-tenant clusters and they're all using the same hardware resource and which ways do they interfere with each other and how does it affect their slas uh and how do we look at that in a more uh higher value way and then automatically optimize it that's going to be a real focus for us okay. all right thank you okay, so i think i'll be more can more clear and more candid in what sean is trying to say but not maybe shying away uh, i believe yarn is the de facto distributed big data operating system and thanks to Artworks. Uh, we, we, uh, we started our company based on that premise uh, and we're constantly, consistently adding apps and other features from monitoring perspective. For example, we started off with uh, extremely rich console that give you all kind of data, all kind of you know, throughput, latency, access straight to the log file, uh, you know, aggregates and this and that, full widgets. We then graduate to providing a key value store all of this native yarn runs completely in yarn in Hadoop. Native key value store, you can just store a whole bunch of keys, get value out, so that another cluster of say memcache or, or anything else you don't know, may not need unless for functionality. If you just want to do monitoring, you could just use this key value uh, store. Then we added, uh, we're about to launch a time series uh, storage, spooling into HDFS where you don't have to worry about, hey, after one month I do delete per second data. You just keep picking up HDFS, right? And then you can take the key and look at per second, per day, per month, or whatnot, and then could traverse it. Uh, we are now also launching an app that's a UI uh, dashboard where you can draw, drop a whole bunch of widgets. And the schema that I talked about in terms of monitoring schema coming out, this UI widgets know how to how to like align with that and, and draw it and say, you know what, with that schema, I can do a table, I can do a chart, I can do a pie chart or whatever. And then you kind of like put it all together. And we actively work towards uh, making uh, uh, life easy for monitoring and application data and whatnot, and we are fully, totally yarn native. Uh, we we believe as life goes on, a whole bunch of other clusters will disappear or co-opt into yarn. And uh, from our side, we consistently and every few quarter, every quarter or so, provide applications to do do make life easier in terms of monitoring and operationalizing uh, applications. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. So um, that brings us to the end of the panel. Um, so for myself, uh, who is not somebody who operates with Hadoop day to day, I uh, wanted to thank some people who uh, have to monitor it not just for themselves, but for their customers. So these are people who really, really uh, have to do a lot of work. 
Um, I think most of uh, us will be around for a little bit longer if you have any uh, questions and you know don't want to ask them in person. But I think we might have a couple uh, extra questions here. Any questions? Back there. Yes. Metrics. If we had to add a few metrics, I don't know, in HDFS, YARN, in the application framework, or hooks where you could actually take the metrics information and then provide a feedback loop, what would some of those things be that we should do? Mm. One, of the, uh, one of the things that's really uh, interesting about uh, MapReduce is that the framework's aware of the separate you know, queries in effect, right? Each map reduce jobs and the separate parts of the query, right? The, the mappers and the reducers. The framework's aware of it. One of the, the interesting things that's going on when you're doing more arbitrary things, right? You know, Tez and, and uh, Spark and, you know, HBase in an extreme, uh, you've got these long running uh, demons that are serving a lot of you know potentially separate individual little requests it's, you know talking talked about earlier um it would be interesting uh for the there to be some standard way that these things indicate you know okay. to a monitoring system or, or perhaps even to the framework that hey i've got you know there are you know, I look like a monolith, but there are pieces of me, right? So, some way to, to that these things, and, and obviously these can be arbitrary applications, so you can't necessarily do it, but if you encourage everybody to do it in some standard way, that'd be useful. Okay, so thanks. I'll add to that, uh, and this is because the way Hadoop developed, and I understand, we, uh, we understand it. Uh, we're not as much SDFS centric as we are YARN centric, we are YARN native, but uh, today YARN is still, YARN has some legacy of map reduce in terms of job starts and ends. Uh, it's it's not a full first class citizen in terms of some jobs running for a longer time. Uh, I think slider is being worked on, but uh, we, we are eagerly participating. We're doing Koya uh, with, with using slider, uh, but love to have you guys drive uh, uh, supporting long running applications as a first class citizens. And that, that I think will enable more like maybe, you know, other, other platforms to run natively in YAM, which is what it was meant to be. Uh, we're getting there, but you know, I'd love to have a faster pace. Okay. And I'll just add quickly. Um, I mean, the, the logs that are produced by Hadoop are kind of a very, they're like a private interface. They're not something, they're not an interface that you should depend on. Um, but I think there could be a little bit more conformance in the, in the format of the logs that, that, that developers put in, you know, it's things that appear commonly like a, a timestamp or um, a job ID, things like that, there could be a schema uh, produced so to make it easier to read these logs. Because you know, in some, in some of the logs, the, um, there's actually like, they're actually trying to use JSON to, to they just spit out JSON directly into the logs. In some of them, they you know, are just using a Java to string. Um, it's, it's, it's very, um, dirty, and I understand that that it's not uh, officially um, it's not uh, your problem because that's an unsupported interface. But I think it could be helpful for people if it was cleaned up a bit. Okay, great, thank you. Another question over there. What about the NoSQL world? Uh, what are the general big data monitoring? design patterns you are seeing there. Are there something, it just seems to be all over the place. Everyone seems to do their own thing, whether it's HBase, Cassandra, or any of these technologies. Are you so finding customers asking you for more standard way to, to okay. look at that? I, I just wanted to, so you're, you're asking, um, they've been talking about basically Hadoop. Um, Hadoop often interfaces with NoSQL systems and you're, you're talking about monitoring the whole system? Yeah, for us typically it's all one cluster which has multiple right. things running. So mm -hmm. we don't really Yeah, one of the things that, that we look at quite a bit and um, is, for example, you know, what happens when you've got a cluster that has multiple things on it, right? So you've got, yes, you've got map, you know, MapReduce or MapReduce under Yarn and you've got an HBase, 
and you've got a spark, right? All in the same thing. And and how are they playing with each other? I mean, that's that's really core to to, to what we're looking at. Um, we haven't seen, to be honest, I've seen those things multi-tenant. I haven't seen, uh, for example, the uh, you know tenancy between those things and you know also on the same cluster, a uh, Cassandra or you know an arrow spike. Right, I haven't seen those be on the same cluster, but maybe we will. Yeah, use case I can think of is as a Cumulo is becoming a more standard distribution with HTTP, at least at at and Big Data team, we are looking at running both a Cumulo and HBase together and maybe mm -hmm. do it through Slider with a few nodes dedicated to each of them. So that, that's where we kind of start thinking, okay, is, should we give more to a Cumulo, less to HBase? Who is doing better in that's, general? I mean, that's... Stuff? that's <laughs> Totally core to what we're, you know, is I, 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 we, we can't look at a cumulo quite yet, but I think, you know, we will. Um, but, you know, that, that exact question, I'm totally interested in the answer to that exact question. So uh, we are a native app in, in Hadoop, like MapReduce. Uh, so we don't face that thing, but we do face customers saying that we need to be able to integrate into the common monitoring. So our web services, uh, all the things we do make it very easy uh, for them to integrate into, usually they have a single monitoring system with a dashboard and everything, but we don't kind of, I think Pepperda really faces that problem head on, uh, uh, unlike us. Eric, any, any no, okay, <laughs> all right, thank you. Uh, any other, yes, over here. The full stack of, I mean, if you have not only edge base, because you say very much, you speak very much about the Hadoop monitoring, but what if I need to go and speak with DevOps guys, they need to monitor the all parts of an application. How, what do you recommend to say this, how you integrate uh, an Hadoop monitoring? And I make sure that your four, 10, eight people that look at everything can also look at potential problems. So Hadoop can have some problems, but if a small application, small cluster, people they start using for maybe analytics, have some also problems on, I don't know, on our DBMS or on other application. So not only as a single uh, island, but how do I know if I have a problem, I need to wake up my DevOps guys so they can start uh, alerting people and uh, unfortunately getting people out of the bed in the middle of the night to see look the system doesn't deliver so start looking what's the approach you you recommend no, that's, a, that's a tough one yeah that's the the you know aka the single pane of glass uh you know with with capital letters in front of every word problem um i i don't know of today of a you know solution that gives you you know every single one of those in, in a very native way um you know there are certainly things that are you know very like log focused that you know one, one could use hadoop itself to to ingest all of this or or you know use a streaming solution to ingest it you could you know um, you know log stash cabana you know splunk you know very you know splunk very expensive way to, to look at it in a very cross-platform way but it works um i think though that having you know i think there's a lot of value in what you said but i don't have an obvious you know there isn't a you know killer app yet i mean is there yes. a way that you can say i rather have better luck i don't know if i have nachos or gandia or if i what's the level or if there's an approach i can go from zero to a full i can start cooking small things and after i build up I, I think the best thing that I can think of, you know, since these systems are so uh, disparate today, the, the best design pattern that I've seen today to actually solve this is to take the, you know, the data that's going to appear unstructured. I mean, each individual one may have structure, but it's going to kind of appear unstructured and either throw it into a system like Hadoop that you could do arbitrary analytics over or throw it into, a, you know, a, a log stash or a, you know, a Splunk system. Are there any other questions? Yes. I have one more question. Uh, so you mentioned about uh, network locality not being as important as it used to be in the past. 
uh, what do you see with uh, memory and NVRAM? So, for example, in HDFS, we are making cached memory and NVRAM become a, like a storage unit. Uh, and so we can actually direct application towards where data is in memory. Do you think it'll kind of, the, the importance of locality will reemerge once again? I, I think it probably will. Um, I mean, once that is available, we will do performance experiments like we had done before on rack locality um, to reevaluate that. But yes, definitely this, this whole um, statement that I said about rack locality not being important is particular to our data center and which is not that um, different from most Hadoop uh, data center setups. Okay. You, you know, if we switch to um, a different memory model, then things would be very different. Okay. I, I think it's proven that the exact scenario that you say is a case where locality matters by uh, Spark. Because the, the entire thing there is use less copies, you know, use exactly one copy in RAM on the cluster and direct all the queries to that copy in RAM. So they, they pretty much have to have locality there. Um, and it's the, you know, the absolutely critical optimization that makes, you know, a lot of it work. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other questions?